Katie, let me start with you on the earnings overall. The earnings really seem to be gangbusters. As I say, almost 90% of the S&P 500 beating expectations. I'm not sure the S&P recognized that. That's right. We had a flat week, but I will say underneath that there, there was some differentiated performance. About 60% of the S&P 500 has reported, as you said, 90% beat. So we either have some very strong co companies or some really bad estimates. And I think the truth is, is probably somewhere in between. You know, three observations quickly for, from us from an earnings perspective. Um, the first is that earnings actually do matter again. So some of those companies that beat, we're going to talk a little bit more about tech later, um, actually were rewarded for that relative to last year there was so much bad news and it was really tough uh, to get moved on the fundamental news coming out of earnings, but that's starting to change. The second thing I really want to emphasize is that we are seeing signs of a robust cyclical recovery. So whether it's airlines, which are now back two thirds of where they were a quarter ago, that's great. Payments, credit card companies telling us that the consumer is very healthy and advertising revenues, obviously on the rebound, we are seeing signs of a cyclical recovery. And then the final point, which I think connects to why markets haven't rewarded it as much is that the there are a lot of signs of inflation across many different sectors. Copier, copper's up 80%, lumber's up 350%. A product, David, you know, is near and dear to my heart, diapers, because I have three kids in them, um, are announcing price increases of 5 to 10%. So people are worried that that inflation is going to cause higher rates and disturb the equity market rally. And we can talk a little bit more about that if you want to. Yeah, and by the way, congratulations uh, on your relatively new baby, Katie. Yeah, <laughs> so great you. to have you here with us. So, Alan, you are the guru of tech, having really been at the launch of some really successful tech enterprises. Let's talk about tech specifically. We had the earnings from big tech out this week, and boy, for the most part, they just shot the lights out. But again, I'm not sure that the stock really reflected fully the strong performance they were reporting. Well, you know, David, we're going through an amazing euphoric period uh, for the, your, your typical your FANG stocks and also, you know, associated companies around that. I mean, you'll see staggering earnings when you see Amazon up, I believe it's triple what it was the same time a year ago. Uh, I mean, my concern is something bigger, which is, you know, we are in a society now where a limited number of companies are controlling an, an awful lot of our activities, whether it's through search or whether it's through its online purchases or whether it's through buying, uh, getting access to apps or getting access to ads. Uh, ads. We have, uh, it's all concentrated. You're seeing it in these earnings performances that are just staggering. And I don't think it's going to stop. I think we're going to see this second quarter is going to get even bigger. I mean, I don't know how it can stop because you're going to be comparing with the pandemic period. So every every quarter has got to be better for the rest of this year. I, I agree with Katie. I mean, we're talking about, you know, I think it was 6% GDP increase for the first quarter. I think you could see 8%, who knows, 10%. Uh, I was looking at Ernest Research study yesterday of Airline Act, airline seats being filled. Uh, the, for the month of March, the, the chart just went straight up compared to a year ago, which was unbelievable uh, after being flat for, in comparison for uh, several months, many months. So I, I just think we're in a euphoric period. And I personally am concerned about what this means in terms of the monopolistic positions that a lot of these major tech companies have and what it means for the rest of our, uh, you know, economic society and I you know it's something I think we we're all enjoying you know overnight deliveries at low prices but how long can that keep going on well that's a great question Katie let me come back to you here what Alan just said yeah. particularly in the tech area are there a couple of possible sources of risk one of them is can they keep this going basically can they keep up this pace of this, this increase at this rate but also going to the concentration issue apart from the competition issues and what that does to consumers are we too concentrated in the marketplace where really a a lot of the drive between the markets was coming from really a handful of big tech companies. I agree with a lot of Alan's comments and uh, a lot of tremendous insight in there. Two points I would make. The first is that um, I, I agree with the statement that these tech platforms actually are going to maintain dominance. But I do believe in 10 years, um, I'm optimistic that the tech titans are actually going to be different and that you're going to have to look beyond these concentrated positions to, to new companies. Just one comment quickly on the first part of it. Um, it is correct. The comps for these companies actually weren't that easy because they've remembered they did well in the first quarter because they have good pandemic business models. And what we're seeing is that they've actually consolidated those strengths, all of them tied to e-commerce um, and cloud, and then advertising had some cyclical recovery. And some of these technologies, particularly cloud, 
cloud is actually oligopolistic because um, it really is a scaled play. And I say that because I do think these platforms are going to retain some dominance in the very near term future. Um, however, I do think it's important to look beyond them for other opportunities. And there are some really disruptive technology, which Alan knows very well, that's out there and available for people to invest in and venture in private and even in public markets. So I'll end with three quick examples of that. I would say more in the payment space, not represented by the, the big incumbents and the blockchain disruption that could happen there. Um, yes, we're moving to the cloud and the most valuable commodity in the world right now is data. So cybersecurity, which you can find, you know, at a lot of small cap companies in that space. And then smart components as we move to electronic and autonomous vehicles and more internet of things. All of those are tech companies that you can find, you know, well beyond uh, the top five dominant companies. And I think they're poised to win a lot over the next decade. Alan, those are some disruptive technologies. Let me talk about a potentially disruptive demographic. And this is near and dear to my heart, given the color of my hair. Uh, you talk about the silver tsunami. I give you credit for coining that phrase. I don't know if you originally coined it or not, but tell us about the silver tsunami and what that could mean in tech. D David, I can't be happier than to talk about this. Uh, I started, as you know, another new firm, my third firm, uh, which I started a year and a half ago, which is called Primetime Partners, which is focused entirely on the what I call the ageless generation. You know, we all get excited about the millennials, but the real uh, increase is going to in the next 10, 20 years is going to be in the over 60 generation. They're going to grow faster, much faster than the uh, millennials are. They're going to live longer and they're going to have more money to spend. So, uh, you know, instead of everybody focusing on millennials, they ought to start focusing on the older generation and it's happening. And, you know, we've we're swarming with uh, new projects. We've we've seen over 600 new projects since we started out last July, uh, and it just it, there's no there's no letting up, and it's very very exciting because uh, just like you said, there are many more people like you and like me, and uh, uh, and they're going to be a lot more coming up, and I think the things they can do. Remember, and because of COVID, they're now all even more technologically qualified than they were a year ago. Probably they couldn't they couldn't have worked with Zoom a year ago. Now they're they're online, they're accessing apps, they're they're buying online. And I think that's going to augur for a, enormous growth in in the older market if people know how to reach them. And that's of course what we're we're challenges than what we're spending our time on doing. Yeah, I think I'm more technologically able, but I think the comps are benefiting me given with the base that I <laughs> started off of as a product. So Katie, to come back to you and ask you the question, yeah. on the one hand, we were talking about the comeback out of home stocks, maybe the, yeah. the, the, the airlines, for example, you mentioned things like that, versus the tech. Can both of them go up or does it have to be a trade-off here as we get back out into our, more of our normal behavior? I actually think both can win. And I want to say, I love this idea of Allen's, first of all, uh, the idea that more people are going to behave like millennials and move online. It's going to benefit banks. It's going to benefit uh, grocery already has online banking, online groceries. Uh, the payment companies at PayPal came out and said their um, greatest growing cohort is people 50 and above. So I big believer in that. I think it's a huge investment opportunity. I also think people are going to want to have offline fun again. And so one of the themes that we're really excited about for the remainder of this year and going forward is the great outdoors of America. So we own an RV company, Winnebago, um, a boating. Um, now 30% of new boat buyers are first time buyers. That's very healthy for the turnover um, of boats in that industry. And there's the company we're invested in also does shared, the shared economy of boating. Um, and we even like mountain biking. There's five billion dollars of bikes sold in the US last year. We think that market's going to grow. We have exposure to a company that makes the shock absorbers for mountain bikes. So very long, the US outdoors. Um, we think everyone should be going outside and having fun safely. And those are some companies that are poised to benefit from it. Sounds good to me. In the last minute or so we have here, Alan, let me sneak in a tax question. Capital gains. You, you have been involved through your life in gathering together capital in order to invest it in new ventures. Are you concerned about really raising the capital gains, maybe even eliminating the preferential treatment. David, you, you feed me all the questions I like to answer. Uh, I think that capital gains, look, nobody wants to pay more taxes. Let me, let's not kid ourselves. On the other hand, I happen to be, and I'm not a socialist and I'm not a communist, but I honestly believe that the income disparity in this country is a problem. And I do think that there have been People like myself, uh, I can't uh, deny it, who benefited enormously from a lower capital gains tax rate. I think what we're seeing right now, and by the way, I, I mean, 
I am not against a change in the way uh, what President Biden has proposed. I think that where there is a there is a revert total reversal now. I mean, the concept of capital gain originally back in the 1920s, I think, was to incentivize people to put capital to work as opposed to their labor. I think the president is saying, I think that people who work hard every day are as important as people who put their capital to work. And I don't think it's going to reduce the amount of venture capital next year or the amount of venture capital investing or anyone else.